again, if you're just a consumer, you don't necessarily think about it. But all those things that happen in agriculture and also viticulture and or fishing and what have you, that there is some often very little respect towards nature or, you know, like uh, that uh, uh, there will be generations after us, you know. For me, it feels just the natural thing not to do something harmful in the vineyard. Kai, it's so wonderful to meet you in here on Zoom. Yeah, well, well, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, so it's evening there in, in New Zealand. Uh, it's uh, 7 30 in the evening or 19 30 in the evening. Yeah. So we are at the moment, I think, 10 hours ahead of Europe. Yeah. And uh, it makes it always exciting trying to talk to people in Europe because, uh, uh, I mean, even after like what almost 20 something years or more than, well, it's like almost 25 years now in New Zealand, uh, sometimes it's, it's complicated, you know, with. Uh, daylight saving time. Yeah. Sometimes it's 12 hours, then it's 11 hours, and then it's 10 hours. And um, so it wouldn't be the first time that you receive phone calls at four o'clock in the morning or something. Like <laughs> but tell me what brought you to from Europe to, um, uh, to um, New Zealand? Yeah, I mean, um, it's uh, I'm not from a wine growing family. So I was the first crazy one in the family, if you like. Uh, uh, for me, wine started pretty much as a as a hobby, and and um, you know, and obviously no vineyard to take over at home, uh, uh, and that's basically how I came to New Zealand. So it, it all started basically with a school class trip uh, to Alsace when I was 16 years old, so legal drinking age for for wine and beer. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I was always interested in, in cuisine and good food, and uh, and there we were in in uh, Riquier. Uh, in, in Alsace and um, we went for lunch, you know, and uh, with a few friends and uh, I ordered a bottle of wine, uh, to Kaila Alsace uh, Pinot Gris. Um, and that was my first uh, eye-opening experience, you know, the combination of, of wine uh, plus food, uh, one plus one makes three, you know, so the combination is a great thing. And uh, from then on, uh, um, it, it just continued as a hobby, basically. Mm -hmm. So I was reading books about wine, and uh, 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 and uh, then by the time I did my abitur, so a few years later, mm -hmm. I then decided um, I should actually make my my uh, my hobby my profession. Uh, okay. Initially, initially I thought um, I was going to study photography and film and become a, a famous uh, uh, director of photography in Hollywood. Yeah. But I had to realize as well that um, the, the air is quite thin there, you know, and uh, uh, and there's a lot of sharks uh, in, in that kind of business, and that my chances probably were quite slim. So I thought maybe maybe uh, the wine business would be something better for me. Mm -hmm. I, I then learned later on that there's actually also sharks in the wine business. <laughs> but um, uh, well, you're um, a dream. Uh, definitely you're a dream. It was the the right decision for me, you know. Yeah. And, and it, it was a slow process. So, so just um, well, how to put the um, well, how to make a long story short. You know, like I first did an apprenticeship then uh, with uh, uh, Ernie Lawson of Dr. Lawson Estate, famous whiskey producer in, in the Mosel Valley. Uh, mm -hmm. Then studied in Geisenheim, and and over that period of time, I spent a lot of time whenever I could traveling around because I was always looking for where could I start my winery, where could I start because I mean. Uh, obviously, as it turns out, Europe was very difficult to start from scratch. It would be different today, talking to some winemakers today, because apparently there's a lot of vineyards for sale, or you could uh, lease them or what have you. But uh, in in the late uh, 90s, uh, no chance, really. Um, so it became pretty clear to me I would have to move somewhere overseas. I, I then worked in Oregon as well, and, but uh, we... We looked in, in California, in Washington State, and my 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 wife Marion, she uh, worked. No, she's a winemaker as well, so so uh, we both started oh. together. In that time. So that's where we met, basically. Mm -hmm. um, she worked in Australia. I I worked some time in South America as well. But then finally we came to New Zealand, and that was the next eye-opening experience, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and we were just so impressed with the wines from New Zealand. Um, and that's how we basically ended up here in 1998. 
Well, I mean, this is a it's a big transition because now you're moving also from from your home and and you starting in a also in a in a different culture because uh, I mean New Zealand is quite different from from Germany. True, but uh, I mean, since it wasn't like a decision that we took like from today to tomorrow or from yeah. this year to next year. Uh, it, it had grown on, on us over years, basically, that uh, mm -hmm. we most probably, we knew we most probably cannot do what we want to do in, in Europe. But, uh, my, my standard joke is, you know, like obviously for Pinot Noir, but because Pinot Noir became our favorite variety, we mm -hmm. first we would look, of course, at Burgundy, but uh, how to put it, Latash was not for sale and Musigny <laughs> we couldn't quite afford, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and then of course there's, Places in Baden uh, of Germany, and, and I mean, there's other places in Europe or, or Alto Adige, and, but it's for an outsider, you know, and, unless you're already part of that village and you know that there's something for sale or not, uh, or something up for lease, you know, all the good pieces will be uh, picked up by, by the local winemakers before we would even know it. Yeah. And uh, so, over that year space, we knew it would have to be somewhere else and mm -hmm. uh, so um, we just didn't know where and uh, I mean um, that's where I usually told another of my standard jokes is like if you would have found the, the perfect uh, place for Pinot Noir in Kazakhstan he potentially would have moved to Kazakhstan mm -hmm. okay now on the one hand side I'm, I, I'm glad it was New Zealand in it nothing against Kazakhstan yeah. but the funny part is Years later, I was at, at the, the Zuma event uh, of Alois Lageda in, in Alto Adige in Südtirol, and the neighboring winery exhibiting there was a producer from Kazakhstan. Oh, really? And what did he have? Fantastic Pinot Noir <laughs> and fantastic Riesling. I, would, I didn't even know they make wine in Kazakhstan. So, so, I mean, it was so interesting to the point that actually I... I I, I um, a few years back now, but uh, I, I visited Kazakhstan to, to visit the vineyard, you know, and it's quite amazing because the vineyards are on the 1400 meters of elevation, so very high. Um, in winter time, it, it gets down to minus 30 degrees, which wow. is of course that would kill the vines. So what mm -hmm. they have to do is they take the vines off the wire and kind of bend them over, and then they have to bury them with soil, and then next spring they dig them out again. Imagine a vineyard where they have to bury the vineyard every season for winter wow. and dig it out. The next. So, uh, well, the whole village is working in that vineyard, and mm -hmm. well, I guess labor cost is a little bit cheaper there. I, uh, but uh, but uh, it's uh, still they make fantastic wines. And uh, um, um, but well, how to put it? I'm very glad it was New Zealand in the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you've got good weather there as well. You don't you don't have that minus thirty degrees. Not not quite. But funny enough, we have sometimes or well, often frost at the wrong time of the year. So late frost is a big <laughs> issue. Um, uh, like uh, basically just after bud burst, or you know, like we have these little shoots growing on the vines, and and, and that's when we often have uh, a late frost, uh, and uh, that's why. You find a lot of those wind machines uh, in, in New Zealand, uh, oh, okay. where they try to pull down the inversion layer, warmer air, uh, to mix it up with the cold air. So it's basically a, a 13 meter uh, big, uh, tall um, post. Or, well, basically like the wind machines we have seen in Europe, only smaller, and they work the other way around. We have to unfortunately put diesel in the bottom, so they turn on the top. So that they're, they're not made for generating energy. They're just basically blowing around there and hoping to keep the frost away. Oh, I and, see. And uh, that's one of the, the, the biggest limiting factors we have in, in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. uh, the second biggest or probably as big is uh, birds. Because uh, unfortunately, birds found out that grapes taste quite nice. And, oh, uh, okay. uh, and uh, there's not really too many natural enemies. And, uh, 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 and they, I mean, especially in drier years, there's not enough food uh, for the birds. So, mm -hmm. so if there's a vineyard, it could be a total wipeout. You know, like it, would, it, it, it can look like a machine harvester has driven through, like all, of, all the stems are still there, but no berries anymore. And uh, mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so, so we have to net the whole vineyard hermetically <laughs> because otherwise um, there wouldn't be anything left to harvest. 
That's, that's incredible. I never I never realized that, but is it is it just in New Zealand that you have this problem? Well, I mean, it's it's also depending a bit where you are in New Zealand. For example, in Marlborough, it's not such a big issue because there's a lot more vineyards and, and less, say, forests. Well, there's also forests. But if you have a very big vineyard area, you maybe get damage at the outskirts or somewhere, but um, it's not quite as bad. But uh, the region where we are in, the Wairarapa or the Martinborough region uh, in the south of North Island, uh, we represent only like, what is it now? Maybe one or two percent of the vineyard area of New Zealand. So we are we are fairly small, uh, um, uh, but uh, 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 that means there's a lot more you know forest and other bush land around us. So since the birds can't find anything in the bushland anymore, where do they go? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, but I mean, on the bright side, I mean it's something we can combat. Well, some would, I mean it's not a lot of work, but we have to net the whole vineyard. But uh, on the bright side, there's a lot of other things we don't need to do. Like, I mean, uh, looking at um, a disease or um, or pests of um, insects, for example, you know, like like yeah. uh, caterpillars and stuff, which is a big issue uh, uh, in Europe and other places. Uh, we, we, there's nothing here, really, you know. And if there's one caterpillar, I mean, there's no damage. There's no point of doing it. You know? it's, yeah. Then we are in a region that is usually also quite dry, so downy mildew or uh, permanospora, again, is not an issue. We, we, we never spray against uh, downy mildew. Um, um, in, in fact, the only uh, uh, um, uh, uh, spray we put on is the sulfur, basically. Um, okay. So um, how to put it, it's, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily say it's dramatically easy, but it's, in a sense, easier to be organic here in the region where we are or in New Zealand because of the somewhat dry conditions and also quite windy conditions, because we may have a rain, but it never sits on the leaves to generate an a infection, basically. Mm -hmm. So uh, the wind dries it off again, no infection, no fungus, no problem. Uh, powdery is a different story. So powdery we can have, uh, so we have to spray the sulfur. But again, this is um, um, harmless in comparison to all the other things that are out there. You know? and, and again, so that's, uh, we are certified organic now. Uh, we started the process in 2009, uh, got fully certified uh, with the 2013 vintage was the first uh, fully certified. Uh, you have to have some transition time basically. Um, and since then, basically we are certified organic. Well, this is so interesting because I think it's, I hear that from South African uh, winemakers as well, that, that that's sort of the route now that everybody's going to be this conscious of the environment and, and what you spray and so on. But I'm just thinking if you if you've done it for so long, can you can you uh, uh, see that there's a difference in the taste of the wine? Or a difference in the wine, or the reaction of the of the um, fermentation process. I mean, it's this is tricky to say. I, I mean, this almost takes generations to find out because okay. I mean, we are here now. Uh, Ninety nine was our first vintage, so we have like uh, what twenty plus vintages in New Zealand. Every year was somehow different, you know, and 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 also of course we we do some little fine tuning every year. And it's really hard to say in the end, why is it different now? Because we did this or was it because of that? Or you know, uh, so it, it almost needs, you know, the experience of, of more vintages. So you have like more data. So you could compare like this vintage was exactly like that vintage and we did this different and it, because of that, it tastes different also. I mean, for me, the organic thing is more just a, a natural thing to do because yeah, I mean, I mean, only, I mean, again, if you're just a consumer, you don't necessarily think about it. But all those things that happen in agriculture and also viticulture and or fishing and what have you, that there is some often very little respect towards nature or, you know, like uh, that uh, uh, there will be generations after us. You know, for me, it feels just the natural thing not to do something harmful in the vineyard. I mean... Uh, just for an example, think of uh, glyphosate, you know, the, the herbicide, or in Europe also known as uh, Roundup. When I did my apprenticeship many years ago, um, uh, I think the sales guy was still telling us, oh, yeah, it's absolutely harmless. You can even drink it. And da, da, da. 
Well, he's dead now. Um, and and also, as it turns out, um, uh, uh, they found out that, yeah, it probably causes cancer. Well, what a surprise. So, I mean, uh, it's it's not only a bad thing to bring it out in, in the vineyard and you may end up with residuals in the soil, in the grapes, and maybe even in the wine, but also it's, it's disrespectful towards the people who work in the vineyard because they are basically dealing with the poison. And, and if you can just avoid all these things, um, isn't it much better, you know? And yes, of course, it's more difficult because, you know, some year maybe it's a bit more humid and you, you're under pressure and it would be nice to use something else. Uh, uh, but, uh, I mean, one has to be um, consequent in, in, you know, like the, the continue sticking to the plan, basically. Yeah. Because I hear often from other vineyards who are not certified, apparently because... It's too much paperwork. Yeah, but if you want to be a member of the club, you have to do the paperwork because uh, it, it's not entirely correct if you say you're basically organic, but in those difficult years, you may use something else uh, which is not organic because it's, it's like saying you're a little bit pregnant. You know, I mean, you're either pregnant or you're not, but yeah. you can't have it both ways, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, so therefore, um, uh, I... I I, I, I'm very happy to see that more and more vineyards come on board to be mm -hmm. organic. Uh, and also that um, I think worldwide there is more interest in organic wines because unlike uh, organic carrots or cucumbers, uh, often the wine industry, you know, people were a little bit smiling because often organic wine, it was also like a excuse for organic wine. Oh, the wine is a bit cloudy. Uh, uh, it smells a bit funny, uh, and overall, it's actually not tasting very good. But hey, it's organic, and that can't be an excuse. The wine has to be top quality anyway, and on top of that, it has to be organic. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, you wouldn't listen to famous vineyards like uh, just to mention good old Romani Conti uh, that they say, "Oh yeah, we do some compromises in quality so we can be organic or biodynamic." No, no. They want to achieve the best possible wine, but also while they are doing their organic or in their, their case, biodynamic practices. And uh, the only sad thing I sometimes see is, um, uh, I think sometimes for the extra effort that we go through, because I mean, we have to do an audit, uh, we have to do extra analysis, and I mean, it comes with a big cost. Uh, I, I sometimes feel like, Shouldn't the others pay for that who still do the conventional wine making or wine growing oh, yeah. rather yeah. than we go through the extra loop of, of doing organic, but also we have a higher cost. Yeah. I mean, I remember, for example, um, um, out of many countries, we also export to Sweden, for example. And uh, at the time, uh, our, um, we were the only organic winery in the portfolio of our Swedish import. And uh, the tricky thing is, you know, one would usually think, oh yeah, the winery is organic, so no, no trouble. It's organic. No, no. As an organic winery, we also had to become a certified organic exporter. And the importer in, in Europe, in the EU, has to become a certified organic importer. So it's all about tracing, you know, that not that uh, something was called organic here, and in the meantime, the, the container was changed and something happened. So, so yeah. it's all about traceability, which is understandable, but it again comes with a cost. And so the importer there said, like, look, if we now have to become a, a certified organic importer, um, it costs us so much money that we have to add to the cost of the wine that we import from you, your wine becomes so expensive, it's not going to sell. So uh, they asked me basically, please don't put the organic thing on the label, don't declare it as organic, even though we were, only to save the cost of the additional audits and the certification that they needed on that end. Which feels a bit silly because, you know, like we are organic, but we are not allowed to say it because it comes with such a high cost. And uh, in the meantime, now they are certified organic, so it's no, not, a, not a problem anymore. But but at the time, I thought like, this is crazy, really. You know, we, we have to keep quiet about the good thing uh, uh, um, only so because uh, the regulations are so tough. And uh, I mean, again, nothing, not, no, no worries about the tough regulation. It, it should just be charged differently that the people who go through the extra effort 
they can do that whilst the others pay for it, basically. And that actually would get more people on board, I guess, and um, yeah. would be better for everybody. Well, I think so. I think there should be an incentive to to be organic or to to farm yeah. organically rather than this all this extra f money that you have to pay for it. So you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it's also the thing that um, I, I spoke to a, um, a distiller um, the other day in London, and we spoke about this thing where they do a lot, but the consumer is not necessarily educated in, in how they do it, but they, but they still do it. And I think the more you, the more, you as winemakers and and you know them as distillers and and everybody really uh, start educating the consumer to to insist on that or to insist on certain things. Then other um, winemakers will also have to then you know abide by those rules. I, I totally agree, and I mean we see it already. Like maybe in the last. Well, roughly five years, whilst of course the last two years were a little bit different anyway. Uh, but we see that it is often actually a benefit. Before, you know, we would say you're organic and people went like, mm, doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, but now it seems to be, you know, they like the wine and it's organic, that's even better. So that's an, an extra argument for the retail customer maybe to buy it, but also for the distributor or importer. Uh, to list the wine because uh, it gives him another, you know, sales argument basically with, with yeah. his customers. So th this is a benefit we slowly can see, but uh, it took a long time. Yeah, and I can imagine if you're the only one, or if you uh, of a few, then it takes also, you know, that extra convincing or or extra effort to do. Yeah, but we really see it's getting more and more now. I mean, I, I couldn't quite say, I didn't check the statistics, but yeah. I see like every second day, you know, other vineyards who are either uh, starting certification or they just got certified. And because everybody, I mean, I see it also here in the village, you know, uh, we have basically a, a sign at the door where you say, you know, we are certified organic. And yeah. well, there's 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 more driveways saying that now, so well there must be more organic vineyards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, now tell me about your wines, your label. Um, Let yeah, um, of course Pinot Noir is our uh, most important variety, which uh, again is the reason why we moved to New Zealand because uh, um, I, I I mean I, I I like the variety of our wines in general, but but what I love about Pinot Noir is uh, how to put it. Uh, this lightness without being thin, you know, like uh, a great Pinot Noir has all these layers of, of flavors and complexity, but it's never a heavy or saturated wine. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if, if it's a really good one, you know, like you can spend a lot of time with the glass because it changes a lot over time, you know, exposed to some oxygen and uh, um, uh, it, it's, I just, like that style of wine, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, um, and and that was our idea that uh, if you start uh, a winery, uh, it would have to be a, a, a Pinot Noir focused winery, and uh, um, and uh, um, also New Zealand. Um, I mean, it becomes now clear to me, but in the beginning, I didn't know. If you look at all the New World wine can countries around the world. In general, and again, there's of course exceptions, but every generalization is not quite correct. But yeah. in general, uh, it's usually a quite hot climate. You know, if you think of our colleagues in Australia or South Africa or Chile or California, uh, uh, it's it's usually an area that's that's quite warm and producing that typical style of New World wine. You know, like a big California Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, a big Australian Shiraz and uh, what have you, and uh, uh, and yes, of course, there's different wines in the mountains and what have you. But but that's in general the style. New Zealand, personally, I think is the only New World wine country that produces um, a slightly more European style wine, having oh. these cool climate zones. Yes, of course, New Zealand is much more primary fruit driven because I mean. Um, the winemaking ideas here are sometimes different to Europe, but at least 
you you have the similar variety, you know, like, I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about southern France, you know, but uh, but if you think of the wine regions of Austria, Germany, Südtirol, uh, Burgundy, uh, 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 um, um, Champagne, you know, this belt, basically, uh, of more elegant, uh, fruit-driven, um, um, yeah, not not this, so how, should, how should I say, um, not not these super concentrated, like more complex wines. Uh, I find, you know? of course, now everybody in the hot climate is offended, but uh, it, it's it's not about better or worse. You know, nothing wrong with the big Shiraz, but me personally, I prefer the more elegant wines. You know, not not those super big, uh, or put it in other words, you know, those hundred point Parker wines in a sense. You know, uh, uh, because they are often a bit too concentrated to me, too. Too overwhelming, and and uh, that is for me personally not so enjoyable. That, that's that's where uh, that all. That's why the critics of Pinot Noir say, or Pinot Noir, that's kind of only half a red wine. Not for me, but for them it might wow. be because it's not as dark in color. It doesn't have the big tannins. It's but it's it's just this this somewhat lightness and uh, finesse that this wine has, as opposed to the other wines. You know? mm -hmm. And and so yeah, so. That's our focus. That's roughly three quarters of our production. Uh, of course, we have different levels of Pinot Noir. We have uh, our two top Pinots uh, would be the Marion's Vineyard uh, and the Block B. Block B being a block within the Marion's Vineyard. I mean, especially German Block B doesn't sound necessarily very good, but uh, I mean, that's that's how it developed. You know, like the Marion's Vineyard, and it has four different sites in it. You know, A, B, C, D. Not necessarily very romantic names, but yeah. it was just Technically, in the beginning, that we called because you know you had to name it somehow. You know, like please pick up uh, something in there. You know, but where? Yeah, in Block B. Yeah. So, so that's how those names develop. And um, in this Block B, we have only the Dijon clones of, of, of Pinot Noir, and we keep them separate uh, to the other clones of Pinot. So we have also the so-called Abel, uh, Pomar, and uh, Ten by Five uh, clones. They go in the Marion's Vineyard because. They are spread out on block A, uh, C, and D, but well, we didn't want to call that wine block A, C, D. Uh, yeah. So this is the Marion's Vineyard. And then we have the more specific uh, block B with the Dijon clones. The difference being the Dijon clones um, are a bit darker in fruit and um, because it's a bit smaller berries as well, they have quite a, a bigger tannin structure. So it's a more robust Pinot Noir. Whilst the man's vineyard with those other clones is more red fruit driven, uh, has maybe more finesse, is a bit more approachable than young, I would say, but still can age quite nicely and is, is overall the more, more elegant uh, kind of uh, Pinot Noir. It's not better or worse, uh, it's personal preference which one you like better, or it, I think it's also depending on what dish you're having, you know, if it's a more robust meal, go for the block B. If it's more elegant, or maybe even a, a fatty fish, maybe maybe the Marin's Vineyard would be nice. Um, and uh, so these are our two top Pinots. But then we produce also a um, small quantity of Sira. Um, okay. Main reason, because um, uh, our home block, which is, we have two vineyards, so the Marin's Vineyard and the home block, very small, only about two hectares. Um, that was planted already when we bought it, and the former owner, Italian guy, uh, he, printer by profession, so he, he planted the two hectares basically whatever with vines that the other vineyards didn't want to have, basically. And uh, out of all the red varieties, he made a red wine, and out of uh, the whites, he made a white wine. So so it was this, this house drink, basically. Uh, he even had some Sangiovese, which, I mean, we had about 300 vines of Sangiovese, and it just doesn't ripen here. You know, it's it's Pinot country, so it's a such a way it needs two years to ripen. So I said, so so those we ripped out, but um, but uh, uh, we had a little bit of Syrah, and Syrah is kind of borderline variety. It needs usually much longer to ripen, uh, but in general we have a quite long dry autumn uh, in Martinborough. Uh, thanks to climate change, not so much anymore. Things have shifted around a lot uh, in recent vintages. But we usually get another three, sometimes even four weeks after harvesting the Pinot uh, to ripen the Syrah. 
uh, and it makes a, a really interesting version of it. That's also why we call it Syrah, not Shiraz, because uh, it's much more like a Northern Rhone style uh, 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 of a Syrah uh, than, uh, than a Barossa Valley Shiraz. And again, it's not about better or worse. It's just more elegant. I, I, I often call our Syrah, it's, it's, it's a more spicy version of a Pinot Noir. You know, it's also elegant. Mm-hmm. It's fruit food, not, not the jammy fruit, good acidity structure. Really spicy. It's an herbal components and uh, and uh, um, and yeah, but the overall elegance that it's certainly not not uh, syrupy or, or too dense mm-hmm. like like uh, some other ones uh, or shiraz. But now these blocks that you're talking about uh, are they then? It's the same. It's the same grapes, but just in different areas of your vineyard, or is it different grapes? Um, so, um, so the, the Marian's vineyard, if you think of it like a, a square, basically, mm-hmm. and one side of the square is towards the river, the, the, the Rua Mahanga River, uh, and, and, um, um, and the back part is towards the bank, basically, or going uphill. Yeah. Towards the river, um, it's more rocky and uh, so more stones, so, so uh, less soil. And towards the back, there's more uh, loam and a bit of clay. Um, and basically, all the four blocks, A, B, C, and D, go the same way. So towards the front, they're next to the river and rocky. And towards the end, they get more loamy. Mm-hmm. And, and now what we did is basically plant, um, um, well, especially for the Pinot Noir, it's all the same variety. But Pinot Noir tends to have a lot of mutations. That's why there's gazillions of different Pinot Noir clones out there. Mm-hmm. And uh, of course you can multiply them in, 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 uh, if you take cuttings of them, because then it's the same wine. But the moment you have somewhere a mutation or you, I mean, or actually if you if you were crossing them, like uh, you plant the seed, that's a totally new variety. So that's the, so you have to take cuttings basically. Mm-hmm. And it's usually not us doing that. That's what the nurseries are doing. They have a specific clone that they identify genetically uh, and then they multiply it by taking cuttings of it, basically. Uh, and that's, uh, I mean, in total we have, uh, how many? We have uh, five, uh, uh, we have eight different Pinot clones. Uh, oh, okay. now, now. Mm-hmm. So it's five different P- uh, five different Dijon clones of Pinot Noir. And mm-hmm. then we have the, the other three, which is the so-called Abel, uh, the Pomar, and the 10 by 5. Um, and, um, uh, 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 yeah, they all carry. I mean, it's all Pinot Noir, so they are not mm-hmm. worlds apart. But because you have to harvest them separately, because they all ripen at different times, so they're oh, always harvested and vinified separately. And then, if you taste the individual barrels, you, you find out that they are quite different. And I mean, that's how we came up actually having the Marin's Vineyard and the Block B separate, because mm-hmm. we felt that Dijon clones were so different to the other clones that we. By putting them together, we would have made a nice Pinot Noir as well, but we would have lost the individual characteristics. And now we have the more robust Block B and the more elegant uh, uh, and, and uh, finesse kind of driven uh, Marion's Vineyard, which, um, I mean, I, I, I like the idea of keeping them separate. You know, I mean, and we do that since, I think, 2003 was the first year we separated them. And so well, that's almost 20 years now. Jesus. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but now, uh, you then, if you talk about this old vineyard, vineyard that you that you uh, sort of inherited with the with the uh, the, the home block, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, are they then uh, certified as old vines? I mean, by European standards, nothing in New Zealand is really old vines. You know? okay. I mean, uh, because uh, I mean, uh, there used to be some plantings already hundreds of years ago, but uh, all those vineyards were ripped out. Uh, I mean, there was then a time of prohibition at some some stage. So, so unfortunately, New Zealand, we don't have those old vines that you can sometimes find in Australia uh, or South Africa or something. So, I mean, the the, 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 the history of, of Pinot Noir in New Zealand basically started here in Martinborough, but that started like in the, in the early 80s. So, <laughs> so the oldest vines are uh, yeah, they are now maybe 40 years old, but but the problem there is n- not much of them really exists anymore because often it was own rooted vines, and and 
um, up to a few years ago, uh, the Viarapa was still phylloxera free. So the, the own rooted wines were fine, but uh, phylloxera was already present in other wine regions like Hawke's Bay to the north and, and, uh, and uh, I'm sure in Marlborough South as well. And uh, as often, you know, people exchanged some machinery and with the machinery, they brought in the disease. And uh, I mean, even mm-hmm. parts of our own vineyard at, uh, 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 at the Marion's Vineyard were partly uh, own rooted because when we started in, in, in 98, 99, or 99, we started planting, uh, the nurseries just didn't have enough wines, uh, grafted wines. So so they said, like, look, you have to wait three, four years before we can give you something. And we said, like, look, I mean, we didn't really move to New Zealand to sit around for four years uh, yeah. and do nothing. So we said, like, look, I mean, we just asked the neighbors if we can get cuttings from there and mm-hmm. and, and use those cuttings to, to propagate them and, and basically made individual plants and then we planted those and that had worked uh, fine. But um, since Philoxera came to the region, we have now a replanting. I mean, it's sad, of course, because now those vines are just about be we are a good 20 years old. Now we have to rip them out uh, uh, whilst they are basically in, in, the, in a beautiful age to, 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 to make some really nice wines. I mean, ideally, I would like to have a 50-year-old vineyard, but unfortunately, you can't plant a 50-year-old vineyard. So uh, coming back to my what I said earlier, you know, uh, uh, by by uh, uh, European standards, everything is, is young. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they talk about old wines when they are twenty years old. But I mean, I remember going to to uh, vineyard in, in in Burgundy. I don't remember the name, but uh, they had this monopole vineyard, and they said like we tasted basically the barrels of of their monopole, and uh, uh, and we went through all the age uh, stages of vines. They, they harvest them separately. So he said, first he said like, oh, this is all the young vines. And young vines is everything younger than 30 years old. So 30 years is already uh, another 10 yeah. years than we had. So that was the young vines. And then we tasted uh, the barrels of the, the, the 30 to 40 year old, and then the 40 to 50, and then the 50, blah, 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 up to the uh, 90 and 100 or older vines. Uh, and um, that was quite impressive because you could see that this vine age, uh, they lost some fruitiness, but uh, gained enormous density in tenant structure. Uh, and uh, in the end, of course, they do a blend of all the different ages, but, uh, 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 but uh, it was just interesting to see what vines actually do depending on their age, uh, what kind of wine they produce really. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, with age, they produce less quantity. So obviously, what they produce is a lot more um, uh, concentrated than what the young vines do. And, and not necessarily that the 100-year-old wine would be super enjoyable by itself because it was so concentrated and so big in tenants. Mm-hmm. But, but it, it, of course, gave the younger vines a much more backward structure in, in the blending. Yeah. And, and uh, that was uh, very interesting to see. But uh, mm-hmm. unfortunately... In our lifetime, we are not going to see any hundred-year-old vines here, uh, mm. unless, um, 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 well, uh, um, how do we do the medicine gets much more advanced that we I, I, can stay on it <laughs> yeah, much but, longer. Uh, but I talked to um, somebody, uh, uh, Andre Morgenthal, he's um, about the old vine project that they have in South Africa. And he's talking about the same thing where the taste of the wine that you can actually taste the sight of the, you know, that these old vines, they take up uh, the the soil more, you know, or the, the taste of where they are planted. I mean, with the age, of course, you know, the, the vine have, has a chance to, to grow the roots much deeper. So mm-hmm. a young vine, is only at the surface, you know, and, and uh, over time, I think the roots go down, what, 10, 12, 15 meters or something like that. So so obviously there will be more complexity because now the roots go through totally different types of soil and minerals and what have you. And that will, of course, add uh, uh, complexity. On top yeah. of that also, of course, the vine now is much more, um, how to put it, uh, safe, towards a, a drought because you know going down so far yeah. the vine can survive much easier because there's there should be some water there somewhere whilst the young vines uh whilst they're still up there somewhere uh, um 
they are much more exposed to if there's no rain, they they probably die, you know. Uh, or it's well, there's other factors as well. For example, irrigation management. Um, if if the irrigation management uh, in some countries you need it, you know. I mean, and for young vines, we need it here as well because it's too dry. But if you always give just a little bit, the plant thinks, oh, there's always water. I don't need to push my roots down there. So it's always better with irrigation you, to, to irrigate fewer times, but a lot at that time. So the water also goes down and the roots follow it rather than just drizzling a little bit at the top, a little bit every now and then. And then the vine is like a potted plant in the end. So, 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 so there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you don't do it right. Uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's the advantage of, of old vines that they have a much deeper root system. Well, that, yeah, and, and that's for me so interesting, you know, because I never knew that that uh, that it works like that. That uh, because you also hear of of farms where they just take the the vineyards out when it's not having enough fruit, you know, when it's not carrying enough fruit. So that's also a factor, I think, that uh, that farmers, you know, the financial side of it. I mean, it depends what market you are aiming for. I mean, mm. when we started, uh, as a, we always wanted to be a small vineyard, not a, not a big producer, but we wanted to produce the best quality as possible and to hopefully uh, have our wines with some top Pinot Noirs around the world. Yeah? Mm. Uh, but maybe the approach of some other winemakers is different. You know, like if you want to put, say, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc on the lower shelf in the supermarket, uh, um, uh, uh, at, the, at a good price point, well, it can work, but it's it's a totally different project. You know, like, I mean, I often joke uh, that, uh, especially for some of those commercial vineyards, uh, they just forget to switch off the irrigation, and then suddenly they end up like with 30 tons per hectare, uh, which I call uh, 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 is a funny way of producing water, because, you know, like, the grapes are all blowing up, blown up with water, uh, and it, in the end, it tastes a bit like 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 water with lime juice and alcohol, uh, um, but I mean, well, how to put it? Well, often it, this works financially actually better yeah. than the approach for quality because, unfortunately, if the world uh, doesn't necessarily uh, know you yet as as a quality producer, uh, mm. and there's a lot of wine out there, well, you have to wait the thing uh, uh, for a little while, you know, to, so people uh, get to know you, whilst if you produce the other way around and then uh, the big supermarket brands just ask, you know, who can produce it cheaper and you, you lift your arms and go, I can, yes, I can do it cheaply for you. Well, that's how you get in there. And if it doesn't taste quite that horrible, you know, you're in. And, and they may actually make more money because, I mean, uh, we, at the best of times for Pure Noir, we produce maybe four tons per hectare. Uh, so, uh, or in other words, we have maybe below 30 hectares per hectare. Whilst, I mean, with uh, 30 tons, I mean, uh, uh, that's uh, um, well, well, a little bit more. <laughs> okay. yeah. It's so in your bra as opposed to a red wine, you know, uh, but still, I mean, it's, um, um, it, it depends what, what approach the winery has, you know, or how to put it, also, if you're just a grower, you know, I mean, uh, in Marlborough, uh, in the north of the South Island, which is basically, is it 75 or 85 of New Zealand's wine production? So I, I, I'm losing track, you know, but, uh, because there's so many more vineyards and sometimes they just plant another vineyard of a thousand hectares. I mean, overall, still New Zealand is small. We have now, I think, 42,000 hectares. Uh, so in comparison to like Germany with 110,000, it's still small. But it has changed a lot in the last 20 years because when we arrived here, New Zealand had only 15,000 hectares. So, so, so they have more than uh, doubled, you know, or maybe tripled uh, uh, in the last 20 years. Um, and um, uh, yeah, if you're only a grower, your interest is not so much uh, um, making the, the best Sauvignon or whatever. Your interest is more how much do I get per ton and how many tons do I have in the vineyard. So it's basically like any crop, you know, uh, uh, if you're yeah. paid by the ton for corn, uh, I mean, you want to have, have much corn in your field, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, 
if it's good for your career, this is a good question, you know, but, um, uh, yeah. but not necessarily everybody has this um, quality approach that they want to produce uh, uh, an important wine. Really. Uh, and, uh, uh, but I mean, that's like with everything. That's why there's yeah. better bakers and uh, not so good bakers or better butchers and not so good butchers. I suppose. Yeah. But now, um, where where are your wine are your wines available in Europe? Uh, in Europe, um, well, some people uh, say that I I like traveling too much. Uh, yeah. So I mean, before the pandemic, I spent probably four or five months per year traveling uh, to find as many export markets uh, as possible. And uh, uh, roughly, we are um, well, we used to be in like forty two countries uh, around the world. Uh, of course, with the pandemic, uh, some countries are a little bit on standby. Um, in Europe, uh, um, uh, Germany is an important market, of course, but uh, uh, we are in Austria as well. So, um, um, Kracher is our importer in, in, in Austria, in Ilmitz. Um, then we're in Switzerland with Mövenpick. Uh, um, uh, the, the German company is called Bionese, fairly small company, uh, but they are doing really good stuff. Uh, they are close to my home. So I'm, I'm from a, a town called Weiblingen, which is close to Stuttgart. Uh, mm-hmm. And they are just basically another, what, 10 kilometers away in a, in a town called Bagdan. But uh, all uh, young people are very um, energetic and, uh, and and they do German wine. So so it's... Uh, mm-hmm. uh, we are in Sweden as well. We are um, um, in Canada. I mean, we do a lot of the, 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 the islands, uh, which is of course not Europe, but you know, like, uh, I mean, we are in, in the Maldives, we are in, the, uh, in Mauritius, we are in uh, Seychelles, we are in, uh, where else, in, oh, in Sri Lanka, in Barbados, in Bermuda. Nice places to go to as well. Oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, um, Brazil is a good importer as well. Um, uh, then uh, Peru. Uh, I mean, the culinary scene also in, in Lima is most amazing. I mean, uh, so so I'm glad to have our wines there. Uh, and then you're also known for exotic market, you know, like nobody would ever think about it. But um, um, after, at the time, I still had to do the German Bundeswehr, the military service after school. Uh, and after that, uh, I went traveling with three friends for, for about a year. Uh, and we had planned to, to travel the whole Panamericana. But then we learned that one year is actually not enough, and the wallet was too small as well. So. But we spent a considerable time in, in Guatemala, uh, which is, if you look at the news, apparently Guatemala City is one of the most dangerous places on the planet. Um, and it, it probably is, you know, but, but then again, if you are uh, walking around Frankfurt at the wrong place at the wrong time, it's probably not a safe place either. Um, so, um, um, uh, and uh, we've been exporting now since a few years to Guatemala with our wine. So, so I'm very happy about that because uh, I, I fell in love with this country like uh, many years ago. But we also export to Panama, which is like, it's like the Dubai of, of, of Central America. So, uh, and has a very interesting restaurant scene as well. And so, yeah, so, I mean... That everywhere. Um, yeah, but you're a, you're a bus- you're a very good businessman. Then, if you can, um, uh, I'm you probably know, spending you know. all the profits in traveling. <laughs> 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 uh, because it it's also this thing to market your wine. It's not just the making of the wine, but to get it out there and to tell the story and and get people to understand what you are making. I mean, that's what we had to learn quite early in New Zealand. That the big issue here is. Uh, it's a great country to produce, but the four million people who live here, they can't drink it all. So, okay. I mean, yeah. like when I talk to, for example, colleagues in Germany, they don't even need to ship their wine out of the, 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 the Bundesland. You know, they're like if they're, especially in Württemberg, you know, the, the whole area around Stuttgart, there's, there's so many customers, you know, they can sell easily their wine there. There's no point going overseas trying to export the wines. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, in theory, uh, money wise, uh, we have a cellar door, a tasting room here, uh, which is basically where I'm sitting, uh, 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 which is open every day. Uh, uh, 
if you could sell it all here, that would be the best for us because, I mean, here we sell the wine at, at the retail price, uh, whilst if we sell it, of course, to, to an importer, we have to calculate a certain discount because otherwise, uh, I mean, the wine would show up at the other end uh, at two or three times the price as it costs mm -hmm. in New Zealand. And then it, 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 uh, it wouldn't work because, I mean, in today's time, you, you Google it and you know the wine costs so many dollars in New Zealand. And now you're suddenly meant to pay three times the money in Germany. Nobody would buy it. So you have to factor in a certain discount. So by the time the importer sells it to the wine shop and he sells it to the retail customer, it would show up at a somewhat similar price. And, uh, um, and, and, and this is very important, but it's, it's also um, uh, a, a lot of work to organize it all because then different countries have different taxes. So not in every country it works. Like, I mean, to give you an example, Thailand has a, a import tax on wine of like more than 400%. Wow. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. 400%, I mean, no matter what you do, I mean, we can't, we can't give that much discount. That I mean, no. or that's in other words, that's why wine is quite expensive in Thailand. Uh, um, uh, but uh, in, in other countries where there's not not such a horrible tax situation, uh, um, I mean, we try to uh, you know find a compromise that the wines kind of show up more or less at, at similar prices uh, as as in in other places. Uh, um, but uh, but it's something that we have to do. You know, like I mean. At the time when I worked in Oregon, you know, sometimes I think back, you know, uh, uh, and I think maybe Oregon, I don't know, know what quality of wine we would have produced, but it would have been a lot easier to sell because, I mean, the U.S. in front of your door is such a big market. And even so, each yeah. each state in the U.S. is almost like exporting to a different country because each state has different regulations and what have you. Uh, but still, uh, uh, there would have been a, a big market in front of your door. Whilst, I mean, in New Zealand, well, the shortest place we can go is Australia, and that's already like three, three and a half hours flying. Oh, so, yeah. so I mean, yeah. if you look at that in, in Europe, you know, I mean, um, three, three and a half hours, I mean, you're probably not even in Europe anymore, you know, if you fly yeah. somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, uh, here, the distances are quite far, you know, and but uh, uh, in New Zealand, I mean, uh, 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 Everybody is living off, of, uh, at least in the in the agricultural industry, is living off export. I mean, uh, or in other words, the four million people here produce food for forty or fifty million people. So be it dairy, be it meat, uh, lamb, using the lamb of course, but fruit and God knows what. Uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, in today's time, it's probably a very good position to be in because. Most countries these days suffer the other opposite that they have too many people but not enough food. Yeah. And, um, but uh, 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 still, uh, these days, especially with shipping things, you know, mm -hmm. it has uh, become quite quite difficult. You know, and suddenly all containers end up in one country, uh, and you want to ship something somewhere, and wherever you want to, sh you know, you, you don't have a container, but because they're all there, so you almost have to ship an empty container to yourself first. So you can put something in it, so you can ship it somewhere, which is not really economical, of course. Yeah. So um, yeah, uh, it's interesting times at the moment. That's for sure. Sure. Uh, in so many ways. Uh, so. Yeah. I mean, that that's always the thing. You you never realize all these these efforts that go into that, and so you drink the bottle of wine, but you you don't always understand what goes into the work and the organization and everything to get that bottle from New Zealand on your table. Yeah, yeah well, I, uh, uh, I I found it funny, you know, it, it's many years ago, but um, a customer once asked me, you know, like, oh, yeah, you, you winemakers, you, you're very busy in harvest time, you have a lot of work then, but what do you guys do the rest of the year? It's like, uh, well, I mean, there's quite a few things actually that we have to do. You know, like, I mean, for starters, um, you know, those grapes, they don't grow on those vines just for fun. You know, like, actually, we have to do a lot of things that there's actually uh, ripe and healthy grapes sitting on them, you know, starting in winter time that we have to prune the whole vineyard. And, and then we have to look after them, you know. And, and, and if you're really lucky, maybe we get this... Uh, little breathing time, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, that would be like maybe late January, you know, when 
uh, or early February. So when we put the netting on and we are just waiting for the ripening. So we are not spraying any, we are not doing it. Yeah, we prepare the winery, we clean the tanks and all that. But once that all is done, if you're lucky, maybe we have a little breather uh, uh, before the harvest starts, you know. But other than that, you know, it's kind of a, a year-round uh, activity. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, again, with all the, the, the export activity that we have in our case, I mean, it actually only works because we, we are a good team here. Uh, if, uh, luckily, my, my, my wife, she's a winemaker as well. And um, well, how to put it, she's not really too keen on the marketing side of things, which is why I was the chosen one to do it. So um, uh, uh, very often I have to travel, you know, like, I mean, you can do a lot through Zoom meetings, but for starters, wine tasting doesn't really work so well through Zoom. You know, you can do it, but it's yeah. the same, mm. like meeting in person. And I mean, just on this last trip, you know, I was at ProVine, I was at Zuma, I was at the event in Zurich and others. Uh, after this break of two years' time, you, you saw how keen people were to meet in person, talk about wine and have some exchange going on, uh, as opposed to... I mean, well, obviously, it would be nicer if we could sit next to each other and having a glass of wine uh, mm -hmm. and have our conversation rather than over the distance. Even so, I'm amazed by technology that it's actually possible. In that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it still would be nicer in real life, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 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 it is very time consuming, you know, and it's not something that you do uh, between dinner and, and the news on TV or something like that. It's... It's, I mean, and again, because New Zealand is so far away, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, it feels silly, but uh, uh, I mean, I was just in Europe, but uh, I'm leaving for London again in, in one and a half weeks because um, our UK importer, which is uh, a fantastic company, uh, they are, they have their 200 year anniversary. So, so it's a family business. Uh, they, they are buying importers since 200 years. I mean, it, wow. It's just amazing, you know, like, I mean, uh, they sold wine already at a time when New Zealand wasn't really even a country yet. <laughs> so, I mean, it was discovered, you know, 1600, whatever, uh, uh, or even earlier. Yeah. But, but uh, 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 the, the country that it is now, I mean, this is fairly recent, you know. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, 200 years ago, I mean, I mean, you, you, I mean people were shooting each other here, you know, I mean, uh, uh, and they were selling wine in London. So, so this is uh, quite an achievement, you know, and uh, and so we are invited as well to show our wine. So, so, so of course I had to say yes. So, so yeah. But of course it's it's a long way. But I mean the Kiwis always are very open to travel, you know. Like I mean, it was funny. I'm actually our UK importer who said like, look, it's amazing if we have a great event and we ask our Australian or New Zealand uh, suppliers to come for a one or two day event to London, they all say yes. Mm -hmm. But if you ask our European suppliers, you know, somebody, it doesn't matter from Italy or Portugal or Spain or France, and it's a one hour flight or one and a half to have them come over to London, it takes so much uh, active persuasion for them that they come over, whilst the Kiwis and Australians they just say, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll come over. Uh, uh, I mean, is it is it a good thing to sit for such a long time in a plane? Uh, it's certainly not ideal, but yeah. um, on the other hand, it's it's one of our realities. Uh, um, all our markets are far away, and uh, if you just wait here in New Zealand and, and, and until somebody knocks at the door, um, it's probably not going to happen. So yeah. you have to go out there and leave the plane. But what a wonderful spirit, because then, then you know, you're positive and you say yes to things and you experience all these things. I think that this is wonderful. Yeah, I mean, but it's also, I mean, it's really a Kiwi thing. You know, when we mm -hmm. first moved here, well, how to put it? Um, and uh, I, I don't want to be negative about Europe, but uh, in Europe often, you know, you would go to a carpenter or to whatever tradesman, yeah? And you have something which is a bit different that you want from him, you know, like it's, 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 uh, and in general, I have the feeling often in Europe, they go like, nah, we can't do it. And then if you're on your knees for half a day, uh, they say, okay, we maybe do something. In New Zealand, it's often the other way around. They get excited. You say like, yeah, you know, I, I would like to have square wheels on my car. And they would go, 
like, oh, this is odd, but oh, it sounds interesting. Let's try it. I mean, it's a stupid example, but, uh, but oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's that that's how they they tick. You know, like they're always, uh, oh, somebody wants something really odd from me. Oh, let's try it out. Maybe it doesn't work, but uh, let's give our best to do it. And uh, uh, I mean, there, there's also this TV saying like, there's nothing uh, number eight wire can't fix. So number eight wire is a certain <laughs> thickness of a wire. So the Kiwis are also just used, you know, like to get something repaired or to get a replacement something for whatever machine. I mean, if it has to come from Europe, you wait for, for week. I mean, these days, maybe not for weeks, but uh, it can take some time. So they had to be uh, uh, coming up with alternatives, you know, and how to hold it together so they can work in the meantime till the piece of equipment arrives from Europe. Um, so that made them always kind of, um, yeah, how to put it, uh, flexible and uh, uh, and just having, in general, a positive attitude, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean one big advantage here is also, of course, I mean, if you think of North and South Island, it has about the same surface area of former Western Germany. Now, there was, what, 60, 65 million people, I don't remember, but we have only 4 million people on the same area, so... I mean, there's also a lot more space, you know, like, I mean, uh, uh, so people, I think, are a lot more relaxed. Uh, I mean, sometimes here people still greet each other in the car, you know, because if I drive, drive to the main vineyard and that's like a 25 minute drive, uh, uh, I see, I mean, maybe three cars, you know, so it's like, I mean, here I, uh, in, in Germany, I see three cars before I leave the driveway, you know, it's, it's yeah. like, uh, <laughs> or uh, friends of us, uh, their kids, when they were growing up, they came for the first time, I think, to Wellington, and they asked the parents, what are those lights? They had never seen traffic lights, because, well, really? literally, uh, uh, between Wellington and Palmerston North, uh, there's no traffic lights, you know, and uh, in the, all of Marlborough South, there's no traffic light. I mean, there's some roundabouts, but there's no traffic light. So, so if they were growing up there without going somewhere else, <coughs> they didn't know what a traffic light is. I mean, here, yeah. every baby knows what a traffic light is because it's probably there's a traffic light at the hospital where they leave. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> so I mean, it's um, um, yeah. But I, but, uh, I can, uh, yeah, I can understand that way of of thinking because I'm from South Africa and we also, I think, uh, you you just do things, you know, and you just get on with it. And and it's yeah. um, I sometimes see my children who grew up in England. Um, uh, you know, they, they were young when we moved to England, but uh, they also have a different way of seeing things. They, I think they sometimes think I'm crazy because I just think everything can be done and everything is possible, yeah. you know. So, um, but yeah, I but think also, it I comes think with that. It, it, it yeah. helps you in life too if you, what, whatever life throws at you, but uh, try to make something positive out of it, you know, even so. Sometimes it's more difficult than other times, you know, but it certainly never helped uh, being negative, you know, because that doesn't solve the problem. You know? uh, uh, so, so yeah. I, I mean, certainly, I mean, as it always is, I mean, uh, just as an example, you know, like uh, our 2022 vintage, this recent one, you know, I mean, it looked like a beautiful vintage, you know, it, we had very early flowering, uh, we, for some reason, had no frosts in springtime, so no late frost, so we came through that. Uh, summer was kind of beautiful, uh, not too hot, not too cold, so it, it could have been an ideal super vintage. Aha. But then, like three weeks before harvest, we had uh, almost 200 millimeters of rain in one day, which is like a third of the annual rainfall. So, with other words, uh, it was flooding. I mean, the Hawks Bay and Gisborne was even affected worse, you know. I mean, they didn't lose only grapes, they lost some roads and bridges as well. Uh, mm. uh, and I mean, you have seen it in Europe as well in the news, you know, that was that weather that's flooded Sydney and, 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 and Queensland in Australia. Yeah. Uh, and that then came on to New Zealand as well. Not as bad as over there, but still bad enough. Mm. And I mean, we lost 70% of our food, you know, because it was so humid and, and they were just swelling up and they were bursting and rotting away and there's nothing you could do. And I mean, uh, it's it's tough, you know. It's you work all year round, you know, and you 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 look forward, and it's only like weeks away from harvest, and you you're planning on a on a not only quality crop, but also finally because I mean, 
since 2016, we had always quite small vintages because of frost or bad flowering. So there was always something, you know. And now 2022 had finally would have been a year with, with, with not only great quality, but also a nice crop in the vineyard. And then the 70% gets destroyed, you know. So this is, uh, yes, it's heartbreaking, but it, it, it's, there's no grapes growing on those vines. Additionally, on top of uh, me being sad or crying or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Just have to hope for uh, a better vintage uh, next year. I mean, what we have was still good quality wise, but but uh, uh, um, I can see myself already juggling, you know, keeping importers happy because, uh, well, oh, yeah. now the pandemic hopefully going towards an end and, and those importers that had been on standby and slowly waking up again, uh, uh, they want to buy some wine and uh, it's like, well, we don't have any, uh, uh, then things get difficult. But uh, I guess it's still a better problem than having too much wine and can't selling it, but, uh, but, uh, but um, we shall yeah. see. So, so. <laughs> one of those things. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and this is also something that, uh, that we don't realize when it, when, when it's something like that, you know, like uh, you have to deal with the consequences of a, of a flood and of the weather and all those things. But now, um, Kai, tell me what is what what are your wishes for the future? Ooh. Well, I mean, I guess uh, that that's for all of us. You know, you, you, I hopefully we, we all stay healthy. You know, that's that's yeah. that's always a good start because I mean, uh, the, the best wine and and uh, you never know, and especially if you think about the pandemic, and we all still don't know really why are some people hit so badly and other people. They don't even realize they had it, uh, and uh, it's so you never know what when the bus is going to hit you in a sense. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, that's always uh, the most important part. But uh, 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 I think, uh, but then of course, I mean, uh, um, uh, of, of course, I hope for some some good vintages coming up, and oh, yeah. uh, 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 that uh, we will be able to. I mean, uh, I'm. Now, how old am I now? I'm now uh, you're in the, I'm 53 now already. <laughs> uh, and um, so I think we can do at least another, well, 10 vintages or so, I hope, you know. <laughs> and uh, and then we hope, of course, that one day we, we find uh, somebody else who wants to take, I mean, we don't have children, you know, and uh, uh, I'm sure the cat doesn't want to take over. So... Um, <laughs> Um, it would be nice uh, at some. I mean, we are in no rush, you know. But uh, at some stage, to find somebody uh, to 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 continue, because I think a winery is really a generational thing, you know. Like yeah. because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, certain things you you only find out after so many years that uh, one lifetime is not long enough, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, uh, be it Bordeaux, be it Burgundy, I mean, they had generations, you know, to find out. What is village? What is premier cru? What is a grand cru? They didn't. The, it, it wasn't like that right from the start. You know, it was just over time and time again they would realize that corner just makes for some reason a nicer wine than the other corners. You know, and then it became a grand cru eventually. And uh, 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 and this fine tuning. I mean, the same in our vineyard because maybe in block B, uh, row seventeen to twenty six is a little grand cru that we don't know about yet, you know, so, but, uh, I mean, you, again, have only one chance per year, and maybe if 2022, all the grapes in that row were rotten, you know, we, we don't know, you know, we, we are missing data again, you know, so, so we need another year and another year, and uh, so, um, so, yeah, that, that would be nice to, to uh, find at some stage somebody who's keen to continue, basically, what, what we started off. And uh, well, and uh, um, well, and uh, not being on a beauty pageant, but uh, well, peace would be nice too uh, yeah. these days because I mean, there was this odd moment a few years ago where I had this, uh, there was this brink moment where I thought the world is going to become a better place. God, I was wrong, wasn't I? Uh, uh, and uh, so. 
I mean, especially if you look what's happening in Europe at the moment, uh, mm -hmm. that this is possible, it's beyond me. So yeah. uh, no, I agree with you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting how many people have now um, when I ask them to um, express their wishes for the future have exactly said that you know world peace and peace in in the Ukraine and and in Europe and yeah, yeah. so yeah I think that's on everybody's mind at the moment yeah it's uh, mm -hmm. I mean I I mean like many other people I guess uh, we were all wrong you know the uh, change through trade, you know, or wandel durch handel, uh, yeah. and well, didn't work. And and uh, I mean, it's also uh, well, one has to fear that uh, maybe the same thing is with China as well. You know, so yeah. uh, we have to be uh, more careful there. And uh, again, of course. New Zealand, I mean, uh, it's one of our biggest export markets, not, not for us uh, as a winery, but for New Zealand, uh, you know, for dairy products and what have you. So New Zealand at the moment is very diplomatic on what they say. So so they don't run into the same trouble we, we, we like um, uh, Australia, where, you know, I mean, um, I know a lot of Australian winemakers uh, who exported a lot to China, and then Australian wine was banned because... Uh, um, um, Mr. Xi didn't like what the um, Australian Prime Minister was saying, so so no more wine from Australia. And if that's your biggest market, you know, I mean, yeah. well, try and find a replacement, you know. So and especially mm -hmm. if you're a bigger winery, I mean, in our case, uh, I mean, we are small. We in a good year we produce like five to eight thousand cases, or, or like mm -hmm. the sixty to eighty thousand bottles. Uh, in those tiny vintages, I mean, we produce like not even, I mean, maybe 30,000 bottles. Now, still too much to drink ourselves, but I mean, since uh, mm -hmm. we have like 40 plus export markets, even so some are a little bit quiet at the moment, but it's it's relatively easy to find a home for those bottles. But but for other wineries that, that have only like two or three export markets and the biggest one is disappearing, uh, then, then you're in trouble. I mean, but... But that's why, why I also always said, like, uh, you don't want to have all eggs in one basket, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, and since we are so relying on the export, that's why I was so super keen. Like, I mean, my slogan was always, even if we had only 100 cases of wine, I still want to export to 100 countries and sell one case uh, to each country. Mm -hmm. uh, because, I mean, then pretty much if, if we lose 10 countries, it doesn't matter because those 10 cases I can sell somewhere else. Yeah. And, uh, and that has well at least not proven to be wrong in the last few years you know because again um um through the pandemic i mean it has been i mean it's quite amazing uh, or i was surprised actually uh, the traditional marks like uk like germany like sweden they actually increase so i mean i don't know if people were drinking <laughs> more maybe uh, 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 whilst of course all those other countries that are more like holiday destinations like mm -hmm. i mean uh, like uh, Thailand, Vietnam, or all these islands, it's not the locals drinking wine, or often the locals are not even allowed mm -hmm. to drink wine, yeah? uh, uh, well, or couldn't afford it because it's so horrendously expensive due to, due to the taxes. But no visitors, no tourism, closed restaurants, or in Thailand, often uh, pouring alcohol in the restaurants was not allowed. Oh, well, uh, of course, nobody is drinking wine, so the, the, there's no yeah. sales, of course. And uh, so, um, and it's really interesting to see mm. how how and if that all comes back and uh, and uh, well also how restaurants have survived if they have survived i mean mm. i mean new zealand has gone in many parts through the situation quite well but but auckland was hit quite hard uh, due to uh, i mean it's it's the biggest airport so if there's i mean we, we wanted to keep covid out of the country so the moment there was a case it usually happened in auckland because that's where the airport is Oh, that's yeah. also the biggest city. So uh, so Auckland went into a lockdown again. And uh, I mean, uh, a lot of restaurants over there didn't survive because I mean, they were out of those two years, I mean, they probably spent um, half a year in lockdowns. And and uh, then of course, uh, yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, well, only a few restaurants have uh, uh, the financial background that they can go through that, you know? So, so there's a lot yeah. fewer restaurants there now. Or 
other parts of New Zealand uh, that are really tourism driven, you know, like the, the west coast of the South Island or south of Queenstown, like Teana or Milford Sound. I mean, uh, without foreign tourists, it's mm. it's pretty dead. And I mean, if if you own a hotel, motel there and you don't have guests for a year or longer, uh, it's uh, tricky. Mm. So, I mean, again, we were lucky here because Wellington, the capital city, is only uh, about an hour's drive from us. So, um, the, actually, the, the Wairarapa region where we are was the only region of New Zealand that in the pandemic times had an increase in tourism. Because really? all the Wellingtonians, while usually over the weekend they would fly maybe to Sydney or to Melbourne or to Fiji or somewhere, uh, uh, but that all wasn't possible because, yes, you could fly there, but then you couldn't come back because, well, you can come back, but you have to go two weeks in quarantine. So, so you're not going to go for a week and a ways, and then you have to sit in a hotel for two weeks. Plus, on top of that, those quarantine hotels were often booked half a year in advance. So if you went overseas, it could be that you're stuck overseas for half a year before you get one of those quarantine places. So in the end, nobody went overseas. And what did Wellingtonians do? I mean, there's not that many options. You can go to the Kapiti Coast and uh, uh, play golf, uh, or you can come to Martinborough play golf and drink wine. Uh, and <laughs> so, so I, chose that uh, I mean, uh, also our <laughs> cellar door uh, over this time has been extremely busy. Mm -hmm. So, so that's amazing. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So but, in, in that sense, you certainly mm -hmm. can't complain, but certainly other parts of New Zealand uh, have mm -hmm. suffered a lot more. So yeah. yeah, interesting times again. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting how things started changing suddenly, how, um, you know, the, the people did different things that they normally do and, and how it just, uh, some industries, I think, flourished a little bit more than others. So uh, some benefit, yeah. benefit. but I think in, in overall, you know, things have changed and maybe in many ways things have also changed for the better because I think we've, we've realized what we had and, and suddenly, you know, when it was taken away that we could be more appreciative, I think. Yeah, I mean, I was surprised how many people who live actually in Wellington, either all their life or quite a long time, but they never even had the idea to drive over the hill, the, the Rumutakas, 80 kilometers really? to come to Martinborough to spend mm -hmm. the weekend in the Vajarapa and taste some wines, go to a restaurant, and, uh, and, and, and they come to the tasting room and they all go like... Mm -hmm. We didn't know this exists, you know, like this kind of uh, wine yeah. Disney world uh, just across the hill. Uh, and I was like, well, we didn't really make it a secret, you know. I mean, I mean, how can you live in Billington and not know? You know, it's it's it's. Uh, um, I mean, uh, it's like living in Freiburg and you don't know there's a black forest. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's. Uh, uh, but um, I don't know. You know, people sometimes are a bit strange, but it's certainly. Uh, uh, promoted the region a lot and now they know it exists and hopefully uh, they will come back in the future yeah. you know? so so mm -hmm. i mean uh, uh, it's i mean martinborough is, is a small village i mean we have maybe maybe just about 1000 uh, people living here so really? it's small. but but, but really... there's another 2000 beds you know in motels bed mm -hmm. and breakfast Small lodges, uh, what the Airbnb and what have you. So, so I mean, it, it can fill up quite a bit <laughs> over the yeah. weekend, and uh, and uh, usually, I mean, you can rent bicycles. So, so it's it sometimes gets a bit crazy because suddenly uh, uh, it, it feels like the Tour de France, uh, uh, you know, with so many bicycles yeah. around Martinborough, you know, going from one vineyard. And, and I mean, that's the other thing. Martinborough is the only real wine village of New Zealand. So all the wineries are basically in the in the radius of say three kilometers, okay. or eighty percent of them. Let's put it that way. So if you go to other wineries like Marlborough or Hawkes Bay, I mean you would find one winery here and then eight kilometers to the next winery here and five kilometers to the other winery there, and then the next winery is another twenty kilometers here. So it's much more widespread. And well, I guess you can do it in the bicycle, but uh, it, it'll be certainly more exhausting than going uh, something in the radius of three kilometers. 
and and that I mean you can walk it as well, you know, and uh, uh, that makes it quite attractive really uh, for for people visiting. And uh, um, so yeah, so we, again. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, but maybe I'll come to um, New Zealand one time. Uh, and it's come only and a convenient twenty-five hour flight, you know. So you should definitely fly over one day. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> hop <Yeah>. over. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you one more question? Uh, can you sure. do a shout out for a, a restaurant or a coffee shop in your area where you visit frequently? Um, oh, oh, um, where would I go frequently? Um, um, okay. Well, I mean, it's it's not a, a, a it's it's not a cafe as such, but uh, I think it's uh, the best restaurant we have in town, and I really like going there. It's called Karahui, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, it's quite an interesting building because uh, the building used to be uh, the Bank of New Zealand uh, uh, in, in, in Martinborough. So it, it was a bank and it was built like a bank, but like, like in a Western town, you know, like thick walls and, you know, uh, like, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but they have, uh, they had a lot to do, a lot of work because, I mean, the bank had to close as well because uh, of earthquake strengthening and the bank then said, like, ah, uh, I mean, like all the banks around the world, uh, they, they shut down a lot of the smaller banks around and then they have only one big one in Wellington and the next one somewhere else. Uh, and uh, so these people bought it and they spent a lot of money to, for uh, earthquake uh, strengthening and turned it into a beautiful, uh, nice restaurant. Um, and uh, uh, the nice thing is also the walls is still in there. So, so they, it's like a private dining room uh, and you still go through the door, like uh, the, the tresor, the, the, the vault, you know. Oh, yeah, and then yeah, there's yeah. a table in there for like up to eight people or so. And then you have your own little... Dinner in the in the in the mall, basically. So, oh, okay. Uh, and, yeah, and it's 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 really nice uh, cuisine, and they have a good wine selection. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, well, that's that's my place where I go uh, in, in Martinborough. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So I'll put the... some other places too, but uh, yeah. But uh, um, uh, uh, for example, tomorrow night we go to a place. It's called Circus. Mm -hmm. um, it's a restaurant as well, but it's also uh, the Martinborough Cinema. So, so uh -huh. yes, we have a cinema. And uh, Marion, she was waiting for it for 30 years, she said, because now the new Top Gun movie <laughs> came oh. finally to Martinborough. <laughs> uh, is it Top Gun Memory, or what's it called? So, so she's like, I waited 30 years for this movie. <laughs> so, so we have to watch that tomorrow. So, so uh, okay. uh, I'm not even sure if I saw... The first one, uh, okay. <laughs> but I should, I will see that one tomorrow. <laughs> and it's, I mean, again, keeping in mind, uh, 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 when that movie was released, it was showing already in Martinborough, like in a village of 1,000 people. I mean, I don't know how it is these days, but at, at the times, way back when I was going to cinemas in Germany, we would have to go to Stuttgart or to one of the big cinemas, you know, where there's the premiere of that new movie yeah. or what have you. But uh, no, uh, I mean, a lot of big movies, you know, the, the, premiere, the New Zealand premiere, it's in Wellington, it's in Auckland, but it's also in Martinborough, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so it's a very important little village here. Yeah, it? it's a place uh, to be. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, Kai, this is so lovely to talk to you now. Yeah, so no, pleasure, insightful. Pleasure. You've really given such a great insight into the world of winemaking. Um, and you know, there's behind the scenes that we never think about. So it's it's wonderful to talk to you. No, well, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah. well, and as I mentioned, next time we should do it in person, you know. I mean, yeah. either here in New Zealand or, or can... uh, maybe in Vienna or yeah. um, I mean, <laughs> 